This is a NCLEX practice test for reduction of risk potential. The practice test will help you prepare for the NCLEX RN exam. This practice test consists of 40 questions that focus on reducing the risk of potential problems such as infection and medication errors and more. Let's get started. 1. A nurse is caring for a client who has just come from surgery and is in the recovery room. The client still has an endotracheal tube in place. The nurse deflates the cuff on the tube and pulls it out, at which time the client sits up in bed, grasps his throat, and begins to make wheezing sounds. Which of the following conditions is the most likely cause of this situation? A. The client is choking on part of the tube. B. The client has anxiety. C. The client is having a laryngospasm. D. The client is having a normal response from anesthesia. Correct answer. C. The client is having a laryngospasm. Some clients, after being intubated and receiving medications through anesthesia for surgery, may develop a laryngospasm during the time period of emergence from anesthesia. A laryngospasm results in occlusion of the laryngeal opening after a spasm of the vocal cords. The nurse should emergently open the airway to facilitate breathing and administer muscle relaxants if ordered. 2. A client with adrenal insufficiency has a potassium level of 7.2 milliequivalent/l. Which of the following signs or symptoms might the client exhibit with this result? A. Peaked T waves on the ECG. B. Muscle spasms. C. Constipation. D. A prominent U wave on the ECG. Correct answer. A. Peaked T waves on the ECG. A client with hyperkalemia may exhibit peaked T waves on an electrocardiogram. This manifestation is an early sign of high potassium levels, but diagnosis should not be based on this aspect alone. Untreated hyperkalemia can lead to progressively worsening cardiac instability. 3. A nurse is assisting Mrs. K, a client who is undergoing a lumbar puncture. Which of the following elements should the nurse use to instruct Mrs. K about this procedure? A. A lumbar puncture takes a sample of blood from the back, which will be analyzed by the lab. B. The physician will insert a needle at the level of L4, L5 in the spinal cord. C. Mrs. K should lie flat on her back for 24 hours following the procedure. D. The risks of the procedure include nausea, rash, and hypotension. Correct answer. B. The physician will insert a needle at the level of L4, L5 in the spinal cord. A lumbar puncture is used to draw cerebrospinal fluid to check for potential infection, hemorrhage, or other conditions that can cause a client's illness. The nurse should instruct the client to lie on her side or to sit leaning over a table with her back rounded. The physician will insert a needle into the back at about the level of the L4, L5 vertebral spines. 4. A nurse is caring for a client who has a right-sided chest tube. The chest tube shows 50 cubic centimeters of serosanguineous fluid in the collection chamber and air bubbles are collecting in the water seal chamber. Which action is most appropriate for the nurse at this time? A. Do nothing. This is a normal response. B. Strip the tubing to remove any clots. C. Place a clamp on the tube near the client's chest. D. Remove the collection chamber and connect the tubing to a new device. Correct answer. C. Place a clamp on the tube near the client's chest. The water seal of a chest tube is designed to act as a one-way valve. Air bubbles that are present in the water seal indicate the occurrence of a leak somewhere between the client and the chamber. The nurse should briefly clamp the tube near the client's chest to identify the source of the leak. Once the leak is identified, the nurse should unclamp the tubing and notify the physician right away. 5. A nurse is caring for a client with a broken femur who is in a traction splint in bed. All of the following interventions are part of care of this client except a. Palpating the temperature of both feet. b. Evaluating pulses bilaterally. c. Turning the client to a side-lying position. D. Relieving heel pressure by placing a pillow under the foot. Correct answer. 
Seif, turning the client to a side-lying position. A client who has been placed in traction for a fracture of a large bone such as a femur will be unlikely to turn to a side-lying position while in bed. A client with this type of injury is at risk of skin breakdown and the nurse should attempt to reposition and relieve pressure on certain points that are more likely to have diminished circulation. 6. A nurse is educating a client who is preparing to give a stool sample for occult blood. All of the following information is part of teaching for this client except a. Avoid eating red meat for three days before the test. b. Collect the stool from the toilet after having a bowel movement. c. The stool does not need to be kept in a container with preservative. d. A small part of the stool from two areas will be tested using a smear. Correct answer. b. Collect the stool from the toilet after having a bowel movement. When checking a stool sample for occult blood, the nurse may need to provide some teaching for the client, particularly if the client collects the stool himself. Part of education in this situation involves teaching the client to avoid red meat, as the blood in the meat may interfere with the test. The client should not collect the stool from the toilet as this may disturb the test results. 7. Which of the following interventions is necessary before insertion of an arterial line into the radial artery? A. Ensure that the client does not need surgery. B. Assess the client's grip strength. C. Perform an Allen test. D. Check a serum potassium level. Correct answer. C. Perform an Allen test. Before a physician inserts an arterial line using the radial artery, the nurse should perform an Allen test to assess the client's circulation. To perform the Allen test, the nurse compresses both the radial and ulnar arteries that provide circulation to the hand. She then maintains occlusion on the radial artery while releasing the ulnar artery and checks the blood flow to the hand. This test ensures that if the radial artery is cannulated with an arterial line, the ulnar artery can still provide adequate blood flow. 8. Mrs. M has had diabetes for 7 years. She has worked hard to control her blood glucose levels and watch her dietary intake. Her physician orders a hemoglobin A1c test. Which of the following best describes the action of this test? A. The test determines if the client is anemic and needs iron supplements. B. The test determines if there is excess glucose building up in the urine. C. The test determines the amount of hemoglobin reaching the liver to support gluconeogenesis. D. The test determines the amount of hemoglobin that is coated with glucose. Correct answer. D. The test determines the amount of hemoglobin that is coated with glucose. A hemoglobin A1c test, also known as a glycated hemoglobin test, determines the amount of hemoglobin that is coated with glucose. Excess glucose in the bloodstream may cause it to attach to hemoglobin on red blood cells. Because the life of these cells is between 2 and 3 months, the hemoglobin A1c is an accurate measurement of a client's glucose during that time. 9. A nurse is monitoring a client for decreased tissue perfusion and increased risk of skin breakdown. Which measure best improves tissue perfusion in this client? A. Massaging the reddened areas. B. Performing range of motion exercises. C. Administering antithrombolytics as ordered. D. Feeding the client a high-carbohydrate diet. Correct answer. B. Performing range of motion exercises. A client at risk of impaired skin integrity should increase mobility as much as possible to increase tissue perfusion. For a client who is mobile, frequent ambulation may help improve circulation. For a client who is unable to get out of bed, frequent turning or range of motion exercises will increase tissue perfusion and decrease the risk of skin breakdown. 10. A nurse is caring for an 83-year-old man who has had swallowing difficulties. All of the following interventions are appropriate for this client except a. Keep the client in an upright position at all times. b. Auscultate lung sounds every shift and after feedings. C. Maintain suction equipment at the client's bedside. D. Instruct the client about how to perform swallowing exercises. Correct answer. 
A. Keep the client in an upright position at all times. A client who has difficulty swallowing is at risk of aspiration of food into the lungs. Nursing interventions in this situation include auscultating lung sounds each shift and after meals to assess for changes in breathing patterns, helping the client with swallowing exercises through occupational therapy, and maintaining suctioning equipment at the bedside in case of difficulties. 11. A nurse is preparing to insert an indwelling catheter in a female client. Which of the following positions of the client is most appropriate for this procedure? A. Lithotomy position. B. Prone position. C. Dorsal recumbent position. D. High Fowler's position. Correct answer. C. Dorsal recumbent position. When preparing to insert an indwelling catheter for a female client, the nurse may have success placing the client in the dorsal recumbent position. In this position, the client lies supine with the knees bent. The nurse may ask the client to rotate the legs outward, relaxing the thighs. A client who cannot lie supine may also be comfortable in the sims position. 12. A client is preparing to undergo a cystoscopy for stones. Which of the following statements indicates that the client understands the procedure? A. I better drink a lot of fluid now because I won't be able to after the test. B. I will probably see a little blood when I urinate. C. I will be able to go home after three days in the hospital. D. I won't need any pain medicine, this probably will not hurt. Correct answer. B. I will probably see a little blood when I urinate. A cystoscopy is a procedure that involves inserting a scope into a client's bladder to inspect the structures or to remove objects such as stones. A cystoscopy is typically done under local or general anesthesia and the client may experience a small amount of hematuria or pink-colored urine following the procedure. 13. Which of the following conditions may warrant a serum creatinine level? A. Rhabdomyolysis B. Digitalis toxicity C. Glomerulonephritis D. All of the above Correct answer D. All of the above. Creatinine is a byproduct of the breakdown of creatine, which is created by the muscles. The kidneys excrete creatinine. This test may be performed for a client who has had an injury to the muscles that may produce a significant amount of creatinine or a client who has a condition that can impair renal function. 14. Which nursing intervention is most appropriate to maintain the patency of a client's nasogastric tube? A. Maintain constant connection to low intermittent suction. B. Irrigate the tube as per physician order. C. Suction the mouth and nose every shift. D. Perform a daily fecal occult blood sample. Correct answer. B. Irrigate the tube as per physician order. A client with a nasogastric tube may be at increased risk of the tube kinking or clotting off, rendering it unusable and putting the client at risk of abdominal distension or vomiting. The nurse can assess for tube patency by irrigating the tube with water or fluid as ordered by the physician on a routine basis or by facility policy. 15. A nurse is caring for a client who is having blood tests and who has an elevated lymphocyte level. Based on knowledge of cellular components, the nurse knows that these cells a. contain histamine and provide protection during allergic reactions b. are involved in phagocytosis c. provide protection and immunity against foreign substances d. carry hemoglobin and oxygen to body tissues Correct answer c. provide protection and immunity against foreign substances Lymphocytes are types of white blood cells that work to support the body's immune system. These cells produce substances that protect the body against infection and foreign substances that can make a client ill. Two types of lymphocytes are T cells, produced in the thymus, and B cells, produced in the lymph tissue. 16. Mr. Y had surgery two days ago and is recovering on the surgical unit of the hospital. Just before lunch, he develops chest pain and difficulties with breathing. His respiratory rate is 32 slash minute, his temperature is 100.8, 
and he has rowels on auscultation. Which of the following nursing interventions is most appropriate in this situation? A. Place the client in the Trendelenburg position. B. Contact the physician for an order or antibiotics. C. Administer oxygen therapy. D. Decrease his four rate. Correct answer. C. Administer oxygen therapy. Chest pain, dyspnea, tachypnea, mild fever, and rowels or crackles on auscultation in a client who had surgery two days ago may be indicative of a pulmonary embolism. The nurse should administer oxygen to address his breathing and assist him to a comfortable position to facilitate better oxygenation before contacting the physician. 17. A client returns from surgery after having a colon resection. The nurse is performing his assessment and notes the wound edges have separated. This condition is called A. Evisceration B. Hematoma C. Dehiscence D. Granulation Correct answer, C. Dehiscence Wound dehiscence occurs when the edges of a wound pull apart. The condition may occur following a surgical procedure if the sutures were deficient. Wound dehiscence may also occur following a wound infection or in cases where a client significantly stretches or overuses the associated tissues. 18. Mobility is an important human function. The hazards of immobility lead to many physical problems and emotional problems. Immobility can lead to detrimental cardiac, muscular, respiratory, skeletal, urinary, gastrointestinal, skin and emotional changes. Which of the following is an example of a skeletal hazard of immobility? A. Contractures B. Constipation C. Calcium loss D. Catabolism Correct answer, C. Calcium loss All of the above choices are hazards of immobility. However, only the calcium loss from the bones is a skeletal system impairment that results from immobility. 19. Which is a physical, integumentary risk among the elderly population? A. Skin tears. B. Thickened skin. C. Thinning toenails. D. Less nasal hair. Correct answer. A. Skin tears. Skin tears are a physical, integumentary, skin, risk among the elderly population. The skin thins and becomes more fragile. Toenails thicken and nasal hair becomes thicker. 20. You are turning your patient in bed and you see that this confused and lethargic patient had loose car keys and lipstick in the bed and had been lying on them. What is this person at risk for because of all three of these factors, the confusion, lethargy and items in the bed? A. Falls. B. Skin breakdown. C. Apnea. D. Lack of mobility. Correct answer, B. Skin breakdown. This patient is at great risk for skin breakdown because this patient has three risk factors associated with skin breakdown. These three risk factors are confusion, lethargy, and the presence of items in the bed. This patient is at risk for falls because of the confusion. The person is at risk for a lack of mobility because of the confusion and lethargy, but only skin breakdown is associated with all three of these risk factors. 21. One of the complications of complete bed rest and immobility is which of the following? A. Plantar flexion. B. Dorsal flexion. C. Extension contractures. D. Adduction contractures. Correct answer. A. Plantar flexion. Plantar flexion, or foot drop, is a complication of complete bed rest and immobility. Dorsal flexion is when you move your foot upwards. Contractures can also occur as a complication of complete bed rest and immobility. However, these contractions are flexion, not extension or adduction contractures. 22. Plantar flexion can be prevented with underscore. A. Foot soaks. B. Foot boards. C. Toenail care. D. Proper shoes. Correct answer. B. Foot boards. Plantar flexion, or foot drop, 
can be prevented with foot boards, special splints and range of motion exercises. 23. The smallest of the white blood cells which also can be involved in humoral immunity is the a. Lymphocyte b. Monocyte c. Basophil d. Erythrocyte Correct answer, a. Lymphocyte The smallest of the white blood cells is the lymphocyte. Monocytes are the largest white blood cells. 24. Mrs. J is in the adult ICU on a ventilator. The nurse caring for her recognizes that her endotracheal tube needs suctioning. Based on the nurse's understanding of this procedure, what level of pressure should the nurse apply while suctioning? 70 to 80 millimeters of mercury. B. 100 to 120 millimeters of mercury. C. 150 to 170 millimeters of mercury. D. 200 millimeters of mercury. Correct answer. B. 100 to 120 millimeters of mercury. When suctioning the endotracheal tube of an adult client, the nurse should set the suction apparatus at a level no higher than 150 mm of mercury, with a preferable level between 100 and 120 mm of mercury. Suction pressure that is too high can contribute to the client's hypoxia. Alternatively, too low of suction pressure may not clear adequate amounts of secretions. 25. The nurse caring for Mrs. J is prepared to suction her endotracheal tube. Which of the following interventions will reduce hypoxia during this procedure? A. Hyperoxygenate Mrs. J for up to 60 seconds prior to starting. B. Administer 15 cubic centimeters of sterile fluid into the tube prior to suctioning. C. Suction for no longer than 30 seconds at a time. D. Wait 30 seconds after suctioning before attempting again. Correct answer, A. Hyperoxygenate Mrs. J for up to 60 seconds prior to starting. Before suctioning a client's endotracheal tube, the nurse should provide extra oxygen for approximately 30 to 60 seconds. Hyperoxygenating a client before suctioning increases oxygen delivery to the tissues and reduces hypoxia that may develop during the procedure. 26. Which of the following conditions is a contraindication for performing a diagnostic peritoneal lavage? A. A client who is 9 weeks pregnant. B. A client with a femur fracture. C. A morbidly obese client. D. A client with hypertension. Correct answer. C. A morbidly obese client. Diagnostic peritoneal lavage is contraindicated in clients who are morbidly obese because excess body fat makes finding essential landmarks for this procedure difficult. Additionally, the equipment used for the procedure may not be large enough to accommodate an obese person. Finally, morbid obesity puts excess strain on the cardiovascular and respiratory systems, such that anesthetic agents used during the procedure could cause further complications. 27. A nurse is preparing to change a client's dressing for a burn wound on his foot. Which of the following interventions is appropriate for this process? F. Wash the wound with cleanser, rinse, and pat dry. B. Bind the wound tightly, secure with tape, and elevate the foot. C. Contact the physician after the dressing change is complete. D. Provide analgesics for the client after the procedure. Correct answer. Wash the wound with cleanser, rinse, and pat dry. The nurse must carefully assess and care for a burn wound during dressing changes to avoid infection, minimize pain, and promote healing to the site. Once the nurse has removed the old dressing from the burn wound in this situation, she should wash it gently with an approved cleanser, rinse the area, and pat dry. 28. A client in end-stage renal disease is receiving peritoneal dialysis at home. The nurse must educate the client about potential complications associated with this procedure. All of the following are complications associated with peritoneal dialysis except A. Hypotriglyceridemia B. Abdominal hernia C. Anorexia D. Peritonitis Correct answer, A. Hypotriglyceridemia.
The client undergoing peritoneal dialysis is at risk of developing abdominal complications due to the placement of the catheter. Peritonitis occurs as an infection and inflammation of the peritoneal cavity and the nurse should educate the client regarding signs and symptoms of this condition. The client may also develop an abdominal hernia, anorexia, low back pain, or abdominal bleeding. 29. A nurse is assisting Mr. L, a client who has a new colostomy after a bowel resection. The nurse is teaching this client how to care for his colostomy bag. Which of the following statements from Mr. L indicates the need for more education? A. I can clean the skin around the ostomy site with soap and water when I change the bag. B. I should irrigate the stoma regularly to avoid buildup of gas and odor. C. I need to wait half an hour after I irrigate to replace the colostomy bag. D. I should change the bag when it is one-third to one-fourth full. Correct answer. C. I need to wait half an hour after I irrigate to replace the colostomy bag. A client with a colostomy needs education about care of the stoma, care and changing of the bag, and irrigation of the colostomy site. The nurse should teach the client the basics of these actions as well as measures to prevent infection or other complications. The client may irrigate the ostomy and reapply the bag as soon as the skin is dry. 30. Which of the following clients is most appropriate for receiving telemetry? A. A client with syncope potentially related to cardiac dysrhythmia. B. A client with unstable angina. C. A client with sinus rhythm and PVCs. D. A client who had a myocardial infarction six hours ago. Correct answer. A. A client with syncope potentially related to cardiac dysrhythmia. Telemetry is used to monitor the cardiac rhythms of clients with potentially unstable conditions or those rhythms that affect activities. Telemetry is not indicated for acutely unstable clients, such as those who have recently had heart attacks, or those with chest pain related to cardiac activity. 31. Mr. B is recovering from a surgical procedure that was performed four days ago. The nurse's assessment finds this client coughing up rust-colored sputum, his respiratory rate is 28 minute with expiratory grunting, and his lung sounds have coarse crackles on auscultation. Which of the following conditions is the most likely cause of these symptoms? A. Tuberculosis. B. Pulmonary edema. C. Pneumonia. D. Histoplasmosis. Correct answer. C. Pneumonia. A client who is experiencing dyspnea, productive cough, and diminished or coarse breath sounds following surgery may have developed pneumonia. This condition occurs as inflammation or infection of the lung tissue with certain organisms, particularly when excess fluid develops and is trapped in the tissues. 32. Based on Mr. B's assessment, what is the first action of the nurse after assessing his condition? A. Immediately place the client in a negative pressure room. B. Set the client up to receive a bronchoscopy. C. Contact the physician for antifungal medications. D. Administer oxygen and assist the client to sit in the semi-fowler's position. Correct answer. D. Administer oxygen and assist the client to sit in the semi-fowler's position. The initial action of the nurse caring for a client with suspected pneumonia is to administer oxygen and assist him to sit up in the semi-fowler's position. Supplemental oxygen will assist Mr. B with oxygen perfusion to the tissues. Sitting up better facilitates breathing and removal of secretions. 33. A nurse is instructing a client in the use of his incentive spirometer. Which of the following statements from the nurse indicates correct teaching about using this device? A. Lie back in a reclining position while doing this. B. Take rapid, quick breaths to reach your goal. C. Set a goal of using the spirometer at least three times per day. D. Practice coughing after taking 10 breaths. Correct answer. D. Practice coughing after taking 10 breaths. An incentive spirometer is a device used to open the alveoli of the lungs. It may be used with clients to reduce the incidence of lung atelectasis.
The nurse should instruct the client to sit up and take slow deep breaths to reach his set goal. Following use, the nurse should encourage the client to cough in case using the spirometer has loosened any secretions. 34. Which of the following interventions should the nurse use when working with a Jackson Pratt drain? A. Strip the tubing to remove clots by milking the tubing back toward the client. B. Empty the drain when the amount of fluid reaches 25 cubic centimeters. C. Strip the tubing to remove clots by milking the tubing away from the client. D. Maintain the level of the drain above the client's incision. Correct answer. C. Strip the tubing to remove clots by milking the tubing away from the client. A Jackson Pratt drain is a type of active wound drain that may be placed following a surgical procedure. This type of drain looks like a grenade and when collapsed, it actively draws excess blood and fluid out of the wound. If clots develop within the tubing, the nurse can strip the tubing by milking it in a direction away from the client. 35. Which of the following techniques can help to prevent skin irritation or breakdown around a tracheostomy site? A. To manage secretions by providing suction on a regular basis. B. Cleanse the site daily with a mixture of povidone iodine and water. C. Avoid using tube ties to secure the tube. D. None of the above. Correct answer. A. Manage secretions by providing suction on a regular basis. Excess secretions from the tracheostomy tube can collect near the stomal opening and cause skin breakdown. Management of secretions through regular suctioning will keep the area clean and dry, minimizing skin irritation. 36. A nurse is assisting with a physical exam for a client who presents with possible meningitis. The nurse bends the client's leg at the hip to a 90-degree angle. When she extends the leg at the knee, the client experiences severe pain. Which type of test is this nurse performing? A. Brzezinski sign. B. Romberg sign. C. Koenig sign. D. Babinski sign. Correct answer. C. Koenig sign. A client may be tested for meningitis by testing for a positive Koenig sign during the physical exam. The Koenig sign is performed by bending the client's leg at a 90 degree angle at the hip and then attempting to extend the leg at the knee. If the client cannot extend the leg due to pain, this is considered a positive sign of irritation of the meningeal membranes. 37. Which of the following types of dressing changes works as a form of wound debridement? A. Dry dressing. B. Transparent dressing. C. Composite dressing. D. Wet to dry dressing. Correct answer. D. Wet to dry dressing. A wet-to-dry dressing works as a method of wound debridement, collecting drainage and debris from the wound after application. The dressing change involves applying sterile soaked gauze to the wound and covering it. As the dressing dries, it sticks to the wound and pulls excess debris away when it is removed. 38. A nurse is caring for a client who was recently diagnosed with breast cancer. The oncologist uses the TNM staging system to classify this case as T2, N2, M0. The nurse understands that TNM stands for A. Tumor, necrosis, metastasis. B. Tumor, node involvement, mastectomy. C. Tumor, node involvement, metastasis. D. Therapy, necrosis, metastasis. Correct answer. C. Tumor, node involvement, metastasis. The TNM staging system is a classification system for determining the size and extent of cancerous tissue. The TNM system helps providers to identify the most accurate forms of treatment. The T stands for tumor, then N stands for node involvement, and the M stands for metastasis. 39. Mr. V is receiving treatment for a spinal cord injury after falling off of his deck at home. He has undergone spinal surgery and has been placed in a halo traction device. Which of the following nursing interventions are most appropriate for a client with a spinal cord injury? A. Turn the client and use incentive spirometry each shift. 
B. Administer stool softeners as ordered. C. Turn the head slowly to avoid further damage to the spine. D. Change NPO status. Correct answer. B. Administer stool softeners as ordered. A client recovering from a spinal injury may be at higher risk of constipation due to decreased mobility. The nurse should assist with preventing constipation and possible fecal impaction by administering stool softeners or rectal suppositories as ordered. 40. Based on assessment and testing, the physician has diagnosed Mr. V with a cord transection at the level of C8 of the spine. Which of the following types of paralysis is Mr. V most likely to suffer? A. Hemiplegia B. Quadriplegia C. Paraplegia D. None Correct answer, B. Quadriplegia A client with an injury or cord transection at the level of C1, C8 is most likely to have quadriplegia, or paralysis of all four extremities and the lower portion of the body. Cord transection involves permanent paralysis but the client may retain some reflexes after the initial swelling from the injury resolves. Congratulations! You have completed the test. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel for more resources.